Well, welcome and good morning. Welcome to New Arduino on the 8th of March. Um, we're going to have a book review today about um, Alex Vanico's book about networks. And we have definitely one, maybe two papers. Let's see. Yeah, that's a yes from Victor. <laughs> so um, the way it works is you briefly present your book or your paper, and then we talk about it to the best of our knowledge um, and just have a chat about it. And with that, I hand over to Eduardo for the book review. Thank you. Uh, so I will try to share my screen. Let me see. So first, uh, well, hello, my name is Eduardo and uh, I'm doing a PhD here in the Neuro Campus. Uh, I also host the Bordeaux OT, which we recently started collaborating with the Neuro Kino. So it's my first time here and I'm, I'm very happy for that. And today I'll be talking about this book, which was very important for my master thesis. I did it in Amsterdam. And just, this is the, the cover, so I don't have it on the PDF. And uh, just to give you an overview of topics, you can find this book online on the server website. And basically this book is one of the core books on network analysis in, in brain data. So they go through different uh, metrics that one can compute, but also give a very interesting and critical overview of the methods and the history behind this sort of analysis. So it's really, really nice. It's not very long. Um, and it's really good if you want to start working on network analysis, which was my case. I basically started working on uh, fMRI data and graph theory, and uh, I had no background on it. And I've never really worked on it. And this book really saved my, my thesis, I would say. So just to give an, an overview of the, the book. So it starts with, um, let me also, it's, it were, these are the authors. So Alex Fornito is in Australia, uh, Andrew Zaleski, and also Edward Bomore. And these are the, yeah, just important to mention. Um, yes, yeah, so let me just go straight to the first topic. So on the chapter one, they really go to the introduction of brain networks and why some people started looking on, on the brain data as uh, a connectivity or trying to understand the connectivity between neurons or neural populations or brain areas. So they explain how the, the brain is really complex and we have to try to understand how it works and talks um, between different areas so we can understand functioning. And it goes through several uh, data modalities and how you can try to infer the connectivity at different scales. So for example, at electron microscopy up to MRI and NEG. So it gives a really nice introduction and inter, uh, to the topic, brings a lot of history on it as well, and also explains this idea of importing graph theory and for mathematics and physics to neuroscience. Um, so yeah, a brief history on the graph theory, which is the main framework to understand brain connectivity. So it basically is the idea that you map uh, the brain areas uh, as nodes in a graph and you try to create edges. You have edges between these nodes and you try to understand how this is creating some specific properties of the network. He really mentioned some main um, findings that are well established in the field nowadays that for example, the brain seems to have this compromise between the local uh, connectivity and clustering and uh, some long uh, paths to really improve how it's how easy it is to get from one node to another any other node in the brain but at the same time having this compromise of cost because if you want to try to have long wires in the brain they are quite expensive in the metabolism sense so you want to have this uh, system that is very not really costly but at the same time very efficient and tree evolution seems like this was what happened that's what we call basically a small world, world networks that this was discovered by using graph theory in, in brain data. And uh, so they cover this main sort of findings on the field, which is nice. And they really have some really cool comparisons with uh, other sort of networks. So for example, airplanes or social networks or maps like this one in the, the image. 
so to have an idea of where, where else we could apply this sort of analysis or with where it came from as well, and to compare with different sort of uh, networks in, in real life, let's say. Uh, yes, yeah, so they really go, of course, into Ramon and Cajal and how he basically started this whole idea of mapping neurons and trying to understand the circuitry in the brain at the micro scale. And then they really go through different methods one could use to understand this. So this, for example, is from MRI. There's some a lot better image. So this would be for uh, mesoscale connectomics from track tracing and, and viral, viral injections. And they have some really cool images on it. And how, depending on the data that you have in the lab, you might want to consider different aspects of the auto apply graph theory because the graphs will be created in a slightly different manner. So I'll cover that now. So here in the chapter two, he really establishes the basics of the nodes and edges on the brain and how you define what are nodes and what are edges. Of course, it changes across to uh, depending on data type. But in my case, I was working on fMRI. So in fMRI, you, you have this um, image that will be uh, registered to an atlas. And this atlas will establish the pool of voxels that you will have, and which will be the brain areas and where you have the signal. So each of these brain areas, we will con connect, uh, consider them as uh, nodes of the graph. And then the temporal correlation between areas are consider considered the edges. So basically, but for each data type is slightly different. And then, yeah, he goes into these details on establishing the different. And here, for example, he has this really nice image. They have this really nice image on the different uh, scales at, uh, and the resolutions that you have for each um, method in data acquisition modality. And I think it's a very nice summary, more or less, of how to, to an idea of the temporal and um, size scales of these these methods on the brain. For example, you have single cell patch clump, but you also have PET imaging and uh, fMRI data. And this, and yeah, here he shows starting from a micro scale, so electron microscopy. And I honestly find the images of this book so cool. So just to see the images is already really nice. Um, then to circuitry, more like a neuron neuron connection. Uh, then, of course, going more to um, circuitry and calcium imaging. Um, and then meso scale, so more like the large scale track tracing, and then it goes into LFPs as well. So, here, here. So, yeah. Connect some of a fruit fly. And then, yeah, some different like uh, LFP experiments um, you can do and what sort of signal you can get from it and expect to how to use graph theory. And then goes into, well, macro scale, uh, connectomics, so fMRI, DTI, diffusion sensor imaging. And I really like this image. So here they compare this brain atlas that we use in imaging with like how to uh, divide our world map and how much you lose or gain by dividing it more and more or less and less. It's a nice comparison because that's basically what we do with the data. We establish what are the areas that we want to look. And this can of course have a bias on your results. But even though um, they could find the properties uh, of small worldness across any parcellation. So that's, that's cool. And this is the TI, so user transfer imaging. It's basically the flow of water and the structural connectome of the brain, which is pretty beautiful images. And I think you worked that in the lab, right, Stephanie? So it's, uh, it's quite nice. And um, yeah, so they go to all the methods, so it's really co complete. Uh, it's good for a lot of people. And of course, then it's uh, functional connectivity. This is more my, my side and where I focused a bit more. 
Mm, and then basically each chapter will be a different um, step on the analysis. So here's how to create a connectivity matrices and the brain graphs. So the idea of uh, you have this sort of, you either have a matrix that you keep the weights so the values of the correlations, for example, in fMRI analysis, or you can binarize it and just become like, I want data that is above this threshold. So it's gonna become zero and ones. And they discuss how this can impact in, in further analysis because the metrics that are used can be a bit uh, or not suitable or have different explanations depending on how you build your graph. And yeah, I won't really show it in detail because connectivity matrix is, well, quite known, I guess. Um, but yeah, so this sort of image is trying to understand the connectivity in the brain. And uh, so we have this ways of doing it, basically. Um, let me just, and then it goes into the specific metrics. So for the degree of the node, so for example, to how many other nodes the one node is connected, or uh, how uh, then it goes into the centrality. So these, so basically how well connected the node are is. So you can have different types of centrality, and one will basically say if the node is important for the flow of information, or it's a node that is key, like very well positioned to communicate to all other nodes. So they discuss all these types of centrality. They always show the the method to calculate the formulas. And also, if you're, there are some like main algorithms, they always always go back to this reference and also compare it to other possibilities of computation. So that's good. So you can also kind of like have an idea of what's the main um, way of computing things, but what else you could do for your own analysis. And of course, it's full of res references that are really useful if you go deep into the reading. Um, and then they, for, so for each chapter, they will have these metrics and uh, I just want to highlight some. So in this case, they, they look for what we call rich clubs. So it's this idea that uh, the node has some important, uh, uh, the brain has some important nodes that are more connected and more important than others. But usually what happens is that these nodes are also connected to the other nodes that are more important. So it's like the ones that are more important are closer to the ones that are also more uh, important. And this feels like this idea of a core of uh, information sharing in the brain. And this has been mainly founded in DTI. So there's a guy from uh, Amsterdam called Martin van der Hoeven, and he studied that a lot. And uh, yeah, we can always, uh, we can find that on brain data and we could uh, understand brain organization using graph theory and this sort of imaging modalities. And um, yeah, page six. Then they go against the small world, they go a bit deeper in the explanation, as I mentioned before, this compromise between the length of the paths and how local connectivity is divided. And then a part that I think is, is quite interesting is that before finishing the book, they really go into this idea that you have to, it's not only about computing what is happening in your data, but you also have to have comparisons to a no, no models or some sort of randomized version of your data to really say that whatever you're finding is not just because you could find a lot of randomness. So, but it's not just getting your matrix and randomizing it. You have to keep some properties to, to really be able to compare things so that of course brain data will be different than random, right? So we have to sort, sort of make the analysis a bit more uh, complex and uh, well taught and they really show how to do this so i haven't really worked on this yet but it's, it's a very nice chapter on how to work on this sort of analysis and comparisons and to really say that whatever you're finding in brain data, brain data is relevant and not just noise let's say and they also um, have a chapter on statistical connectomics so they also explain the statistical side of the comparisons that one might do using this data. So for example, when you go to fMRI uh, multiple comparisons, how to correct for that, what are the pros and cons of this um, corrections, how strict they are. They also bring some methods on uh, how to threshold the matrix. If you can just do it as an arbitrary threshold or you have some methods that are based on the statistics to do it, to back your choice. And I think it's, it's a very, very complete book. So if anyone is interested in this sort of analysis should really have a look. 
And this also was um, based the, the work that we developed in our lab that's now a computational tutorial on GitHub to try to compute this matrix following more or less this bug structure on fMRI brain data. So yeah, it's, it was a really cool book. Nice. And just to not to, I just want to tell you about something else. So I was discussing with Stephanie last week and we thought it could be cool to share with you. So um, I don't know if you ever heard about this website called Puppier, but the idea is that uh, some researchers had some journal clubs in their labs and they wanted the discussion to be out there. And so for other people, but also the author see in the, the comments. And they developed this website called Puppier. So basically what you can do is that you can use a DOI here and you can find a paper and you can comment on other people's work after they've been published. So for example, let's just get an example here. So here you can see that the paper is here, the title, and then someone commented something on the figure. And then uh, the author replied on what happened and why. So this is a very nice way to interact with the scientific community. And also it's been used a lot to identify fraud because uh, you can post it anonymously. So it's sort of a, a way of having some sort of conversation after the uh, papers are published and uh, with the, your peers. So I think it's, it's really cool and could be useful if you have journal clubs in your lab and you want to implement it's a really nice tool. And lastly, uh, I would like just to mention that, yes, uh, we have the Bordeaux T, so it's a um, journal club at the Neuro Campus on Open Science. And if you are uh, interested in that, we are meet every month and I will leave the link on the, the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, just as an addition to uh, the website you just showed us, Papier, it mm -hmm. also links into PubMed. So you can see when you do your search on PubMed, which papers yeah. are commented on. Perfect. Yeah, so they have this extension that you can install. It doesn't seem to be oh, here, so as you can see. Uh, basically with this extension, they will always flag which papers were already there. So it's a nice way to know as well. And if you want to see if your own works there, perhaps it's a good way. <laughs> people are talking about your work as well. Lovely, thank you. Uh, coming back to the book, any any comments, any questions? I know at least one of you has read it as well. Uh, Michelle. So, you know, it's not really a question about the book, but you say a bit, it's usually graph theory analysis are in two dimensions. But do you think we'll be able to add like a third dimension and start creating object, a graph in three dimension? A graph Typically when the plan gets a lot more complex and you need to capture a lot, you know, more of the interaction between the nodes, instead of doing it in two dimension and having it flat, you can do it in three dimensions to be more representative. Yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that would be very important. And I think that's more or less the idea behind using either, for example, in Pearson's, uh, in fMRI data, using a three point Pearson correlation or something like that, mm -hmm. and trying to really have the set, the set of mathematical tools to build connectivity from the data, but you can really infer the connectivity in a strong based manner. Because for now, for example, um, we have this new framework called topological data analysis. So which basically try to go in uh, other dimensions of the data and try to understand um, connectivity through higher order interaction. So it's not only pairwise, but uh, uh, beyond that, so triangles, tetrahedrons. But we are still working on the connectivity matrix as, a, as it is. So the best I would say would be to develop these tools in which you can find values of a true connectivity between more than pairwise relationships. And I guess we are still like in the mathematical framework for that. I'm not sure if you know of anything else that could, you know. Yeah. I think you won him over with the triangles already. <laughs> so um, just for clarification and also to emphasize your fantastic work, 
So you basically created a script that follows the step described in the book of how to analyze your data. Did I get this right? Yes, more or less. It was strongly based on the book. Some things we had to adapt either because of the Python package was a bit different and how they define the, the metric, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, yes, I would say overall, yes. some things we built ourselves uh, because it's not really covered by the book. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the core part follows the, the idea of the book, yeah. Lovely. So if you could share the link in the chat for everyone, that would be sure. great. And um, there's one more question from Valentina. You've just stole my my question. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you if the book provides uh, examples and uh, what's the um, preferential or uh, the, the book's uh, adv advice for uh, the utilization of some software or uh, uh, Python code. Yeah, so the book itself doesn't really go into that. They, they mm. talk more about like uh, the algorithms and the maths and alternatives in that sense. But the thing that we built in Amsterdam is the idea, that was the idea is to build a sort of resource where you can find where to compute these things in Python, how to compute these things in Python, but also some things in MATLAB because in the lab we also work with MATLAB. Okay. So there's a list of resources on at least where to start looking for things. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hello. Coming up now, uh, Victor, I think was first. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, because I've seen a lot of uh, papers about the, uh, well, connect, uh, the, um, the network aspect of the brain, uh, in particular, the, um, the mathematical aspect of the networks. And I think it's really interesting to understand how it works uh, and very important to look at. And I was wondering uh, if there was uh, some um, some applications, uh, some uh, in, in disease, I mean, the, uh, the some clinical applications of these kind of uh, models uh, that uh, were uh, existing today. Um, I, on my side, what I've seen in the lab, to be honest, I'm quite new to the field on the clinics much more, so I don't know if Michelle would have more comments on that, but um, what I see is that people seem to be mainly looking out for sort of markers and they try to use these metrics to try to identify differences that would allow them to somehow interfere in the, the process of treatment. So for example, in the lab that we work in Amsterdam, they work on cognition. So they use these metrics to try to understand what might be happening in the brain so that then they can tackle and find a way of uh, changing things, right? So I don't know if it's using stimulation on the brain, magnetic stimulation. So for now, what I see is more like using as a marker, and then you can use think about the treatment afterwards. Okay, thank you. Leah, you also had a question? Yes. So first, thank you for showing the book. Like uh, when I had a, a look at this book, I just jumped to the last chapter when there was the statistical framework. So I didn't see or I didn't remember all these nice pictures. So maybe I should reread this book. So thank you to show that. And um, I want to ask you, like, uh, the, the sensation that um, I had when I was, like, reading these books about networks uh, is that, like, wow, a lot of publication, a lot of things that uh, um, have been made, like, in different fields. So it seems that maybe you have, like, look uh, to everything. So what's uh, new? I had this sensation, sensation that uh, uh, this field was explored uh, uh, maybe too much because uh, at some point there were like network and if you look also to the uh, rate of publications about this field they like explode at some point uh, and so I had this sensation and uh, also this sense of uh, a little bit uh, so loss so what's uh, the uh, novelty what I can do so I, I think that what you do it's really useful like the book for implement these uh, algorithms uh, then it's really useful and I want to ask you if you had this uh, sensations so it was like a really uh, huge field and really uh, that exploded years ago yes yes i think it does you can see that it's like a quite established uh, framework i think uh, maybe for the past 10 years i'm not really sure but i would say so uh, and it has exploded indeed so <clears throat> my work on the in amsterdam was not i mean was this but the focus on is it something called topological data analysis 
So it's basically, it's a, a new framework for uh, understanding brain data through networks and connectivity. So um, I would say that graph theory is, it is really important, but we might need something else now, at, at least a different perspective or different print and topological data analysis going that way. So if you want to perhaps find something on where to go, if you ask, I would maybe go on that sense, or of course, it's also always important to have different uh, data. Or now we are collecting more and more data in different with different resolutions, right? So we might still apply this framework on better data, let's say. But, uh, on framework level, I would say we might want to have a look on topological data analysis. Yeah, I agree. That's a, it's a really interesting uh, new perspective. Thank you. Mm. Lovely. I think we got all the questions. Thank you again for presenting the book and showing us the websites. Uh, don't forget to share the link to your own website so people can have a look at it. Right. Thank you for the questions. We're moving on to uh, the first paper. Let's see if we can get both in today. Um, and we're coming back to our main theme of clinical work uh, with Parkinsonian monkeys today. Laura, take it away. Okay, so uh, this morning I wanted to present this paper. It came out uh, last week in Nature Medicine. And uh, I found it to be very cool because it uses this uh, exciting technique, which is the autologous transplant therapy. And uh, it is used to try to see whether we can, uh, with this method, alleviate the symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. It is a study that uh, was uh, carried out in monkeys. Um, so we can start from the assumption that um, Parkinson's disease is related to the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain. And uh, given this, the um, transplant technique uh, has always been, uh, has recently been uh, um, very interesting uh, for the treatment of the symptoms related to PD. Uh, indeed, uh, there are different studies that uh, try to use uh, uh, transplant, uh, uh, for example, of fetal mesencephalic tissues in order to try to improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease in animals. But the problem is that uh, when you um, use to graph uh, to graft cells from uh, uh, one animal to another, uh, there can be issues of compatibility. So uh, the fact that uh, um, pluripotent stem cells can be uh, extracted from uh, other cells of the same individual opens the possibility to use uh, cells coming from uh, the same animal, uh, transplant them uh, um, after they have been uh, declined into the type of cells that we need. So uh, basically, the study uses uh, 10 monkeys, which I think is uh, quite a big sample for uh, non-primate, non-human primate studies. And uh, these monkeys were divided into two groups. So, uh, one second. Okay. So um, there was one group made of five monkeys, which uh, were then. Uh, um, declined uh, into the autologous group, uh, meaning that they would have received uh, a transplant of cells uh, um, coming from uh, themselves, let's say. Uh, so basically, uh, tissue cells uh, were uh, skin tissue cells were derived, were uh, extracted, then they were uh, converted into pluripotent stem cells, and then uh, they were in turn converted into dopaminergic progenitors. And for the autologous group, they were re-injected within the same, uh, the same subject, let's say, uh, while the allogenic group, which was made of other five monkeys, received the dominagic progenitor that were derived from another animal. Um, the Parkinson-like disease, the, let's say the animal model for Parkinson disease was, um, was uh, made by using this substance that is MPTP. Um, and uh, what you can see here is due to the fact that uh, the authors decided to do a NEMI Parkinsonian model, meaning that the injection of MPTP was made uh, only in the right uh, intracarotid artery. So uh, the degeneration was caused uh, only uh, for uh, one hemisphere. And then uh, the motor symptoms that derived uh, were, uh, could be seen only in the contralateral part of the body. 
So uh, the injection was made uh, on the right side. Uh, this is uh, FMS, uh, it's a uh, fine motor skill scale, meaning that uh, they, they did this task to the monkey uh, to see whether they were able to do fine movements. And uh, the higher the, the value of this FMS, the worse the performance. So um, here there is the comparison uh, uh, with uh, pre-MPTP injection and post-MPTP injection for the left hand and the right hand. And we can see that uh, the decrease of the performance was, uh, could be seen only in the left hand, given that we have the injection in the right side of the brain. So um, as I said before, they use this uh, FMS uh, scale for, the, for evaluating the um, fine motor uh, skills. They also use uh, this uh, clinical rating scale which uh, on the other hand tried to see uh, whether there were symptoms that uh, can be traced back to the classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, for example, radikinesia, tremor, and uh, impaired gait. Uh, so after the animals uh, got a PTP, uh, there was a gap of two years. And after two years, they received the, the transplant of um, dopaminergic progenitors uh, in, um, in the midbrain. And uh, what you can see in these graphs uh, is that the zero represents the time in, in which uh, the animals uh, got uh, the cell transplant, meaning that uh, the previous 12 months was uh, a period in which they were already intoxicated with MPTP. So they already showed uh, um, symptoms uh, related to Parkinson's disease because also for the CRS, uh, the higher the, the value, uh, the, let's say, the more evident uh, were the symptoms related to PD. So they have these, for both groups, uh, they have these uh, very accentuated symptoms of PD. And then after the transplant, uh, the two group differentiate. In red, we have the group which received the allogenic transplant, uh, which uh, more or less uh, remained the same in performance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the autologous group uh, um, started to, to show less and less uh, Parkinsonian-like symptoms. Uh, this is uh, more or less the same for the fine um, motor skills. Uh, so we see that only the uh, autologous group shows an improvement in the performance. So moving on, um, we have this data coming from a PET study. Um, they were looking for uh, these, the, let's say, the, the activity, the binding potential of uh, a substance that binds to dopaminergic neurons, uh, meaning that uh, we can see from PET uh, if we have an activity of dopaminergic neurons. The first two rows are devoted to the um, allogenic group. In the first row, we have the pre-transplant um, condition and in the second row we have the post-transplant condition and basically we can see that uh, at very there is no difference in the activity. On the other hand when we move uh, uh, to the uh, autologous group the other two rows we see as it is indicated uh, in these uh, from these uh, white arrows that uh, uh, there is a change uh, uh, in the activity of dopaminergic neurons and uh, the arrow indicates uh, the site in which uh, the graft of uh, dopaminergic progenitor was made. So um, maybe it's more clear from this graph. Uh, we can see in red, we have uh, the uh, allogenic group. In blue, we have the autologous group, pre and, pro and post uh, transplant. Uh, the binding potential, which is kind of a proxy of the activity of uh, dopaminergic neuron. Uh, and the, we see that there is a huge uh, difference on this uh, binding potential, which uh, becomes higher after the transplantation, but only for the autologous group. Uh, these are data that are done with um, TH immuno, immunostaining, okay. Uh, so the animals after two years uh, from when they received the, the cell transplant were um, sacrificed 
And uh, we can see here, the first image is for the allogenic group that uh, the regions in which uh, uh, there, um, there was the grafta, and in particular, as it is uh, zoomed here, the put putamen, uh, the, there are some uh, cells, uh, but compared to the autologous group, these cells uh, are in a region that is uh, very, very limited and uh, of which the borders are quite neat. On the other hand, for the autologous group, uh, it seems like the cells have uh, um, well integrated uh, in the host. Um, this, is, uh, also, this also can be seen here. So we have uh, um, more cells that uh, derived from the transplant of cells for the autologous group uh, compared to the allogenic group. And uh, yes, what you can see here is that, uh, um, as seen before, the, the, the cells for the autologous group are more, uh, have a, um, a major extent, let's say, and uh, the wiring is, uh, is higher. Um, also, this graph here shows uh, more or less the same. It investigates uh, the distance uh, um, from the graph sites, uh, in which we can still uh, see um, neurons uh, uh, which were transplanted or the extent uh, wiring of neurons that were transplanted. So compared to a uh, control condition that is given by the site that was not lesioned, uh, in which the, the, the neural density is uh, um, more or less the same uh, uh, and um, across, uh, across uh, moving from the site of the graft, which is the zero here. Uh, on the other hand, for the allogenic transplant, we have this um, decrease of uh, the presence of these neurons um, quite near uh, from the site of uh, transplantation. While for the autologous group, uh, we can see that the decrease is more gradual and we can uh, still have traces of, uh, of these neurons also um, at a, quite a far distance from the transplant side. So what the authors propose is that uh, the um, immune system of uh, the animals uh, that uh, uh, received uh, dopaminergic progenitors coming from other animals so that uh, underwent the analogenic transplant uh, um, was not, uh, let's say, it uh, attacked uh, the cells coming from another animal, and therefore did not allow for the integrate complete integration of the of these cells within the the system of the host. Uh, the authors also did a correlational analysis between uh, the performance, let's say, behavioral performance, and uh, for this uh, CRS meaning the um, Parkinsonian-like uh, symptoms and uh, the binding potential that is what uh, we have seen to, let's say, represent the activity of dopaminergic neurons. And what we can see here is that uh, uh, the higher the FMS, meaning the worst uh, the performance for uh, five uh, fine uh, movement skills, fine uh, motor skills, uh, so the worse the performance, uh, the lower the binding potential. So the best the performance, the higher the binding potential, meaning that uh, the higher the activity of the dopaminergic neurons, uh, the, the better uh, the performance for uh, uh, fine movements. Uh, it was also shown uh, uh, the same for the CRS, meaning overall the symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. And also they did a correlation, uh, they found a correlation between uh, the, this binding potential, so the activity of the dopaminergic neurons, and uh, the total number of the cells uh, that were uh, grafted, um, meaning that uh, more or less they, they represent the same. So the higher the number of cells, uh, uh, the higher the activity coming from the putamen. Um, yes, so this is basically all. Uh, the authors also propose a kind of a model in which they estimate uh, the number of cells that need to be grafted uh, within the monkey 
and therefore given the the ratio between uh, the the brain uh, of the monkey and the human to try to see which is the number of cells which should be grafted in uh, in humans in order to have uh, an improvement of the performance which uh, stays around uh, 50% as it is seen uh, from this study. So yes, um, ah, another thing that they do was to, um, to try to see whether uh, also mood uh, disorders that were related to Parkinson's disease uh, could be alleviated uh, by these, um, by these uh, transplants. So I'll show you, I think this is, yes. So they have these uh, different uh, um, indexes of uh, mood uh, disorders, which are, for example, for example, anxious pacing, uh, lack of motivation, or uh, uh, self-injury behavior. Um, and what the authors claim is that uh, when you have an autologous uh, transplant, uh, there is also uh, an improvement uh, of uh, the um, of the mood disorders, let's say, or depression-like uh, symptoms. But uh, I'm not very convinced about this because in this graph, you see that the zero is the time in which they receive the transplant. So the red one is uh, the allogenic group, while the blue one is the autologous group. And uh, they claim that uh, they had uh, let's say less depressive symptoms in the autologous group. But from what I see here, for example, uh, the, the allogenic group already had uh, less um, depressive symptoms before the transplant. So Parkinson disease was induced and then here they had the transplantation, but as you can see, we already have a difference between the two groups. So. I don't know if you have any hints on this, I would be happy to know what you think. And that's all. If you have any question or comments, uh, go ahead. Lovely, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Victor. Hey, hi Laura, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to know if, well, if this is a very promising uh, technique uh, and I was needed to know if there was any uh, human trial that were uh, on the way or maybe planned for the future because uh, this is still a, a very terrible disease so the faster we have something that work or even kind of work the better. Yeah um, the only thing that I know about this is something that I read here so it is not the first time that they try to use the autologous transplant for uh, treating the, the, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So there was another study that did this in monkeys, but also one study that did this in, in a patient with Parkinson's disease. But as it says here, uh, the patient with PD showed minor recovery two years after an autologous transplant. Um, something that uh, maybe I, I, I didn't see it, but I think something that is missing is in this study is that maybe um, there is no explanation of why it may, I mean, let's say, um, what is the reason why um, there is this difference between previous studies in which the transplant didn't get uh, the, the same results in monkeys or why uh, these didn't work in, uh, in the human patients. So I really don't know uh, what is this, uh, because it seemed to work good in this study. I don't know which is the, the limit uh, that there might be uh, between this study and previous study. And of course, uh, the application in humans is something uh, completely different. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Leah, you also have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, I was trying to understand how this uh, transplant was um, working. So, if it's uh, so allogenic, is from some another uh, monkey, another person. If it's uh, uh, auto, is from yourself. Is it is it correct? Yeah. And how from it works your... from yourself? Like from I, I, uh... I, I never I never heard about this. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have the basics. 
also for me was something like, oh, this is super cool. Uh, basically, from what I got, they take uh, skin tissue from the animal and uh, there are a lot of uh, procedure. You can see it uh, in this paper, in the methods uh, section. It's super complex and I was not able to fully understand it. Yeah, but they um, some preparation, given that uh, you, you eventually end up with these pluripotent stem cells, meaning that uh, they are cells that then after you can, with other preparation, decline into, I think, whatever you want whichever type of cells that you want to obtain. And uh, what they did was to do this preparation in order to decline these pluripotent stem cells into dopaminergic progenitors. And then they, uh, for the autologous group, uh, they re-injected these cells, uh, therefore coming from the same uh, subject uh, within uh, the, the monkey. Okay, so that was the process, thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Are there any other questions? Are you scratching or? No, you have a question, Misha. I genuinely have questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was really clear. I was, you know, I was wondering, so is there any genetic relationship between the allogenic group and the autologous group? Are they like brothers? How much do they share, you know, because if the cell do not work as well in the allogenic than in the autologous, you know, that might be because of antigen viability, but I was wondering how much the genetic making was different. Is it I mentioned mean, in the text of, you know, whether like it's a colony of brothers and sisters or, you know? I, they don't mention it. Um, I'm not sure about that. But given the fact that when they, I, I don't even know whether the allogenic uh, group uh, received the uh, um, cells coming from, uh, let, let's say, a line of uh, cells from the other group of monkey. Maybe it was a line of cells that was developed for um, another reason, or maybe for uh, from uh, another group of animals. I'm not I sure. I see. About I see. Okay. Like the graph suggests that it would be this way, and then you're like, oh, it yeah. doesn't work, but you know, yeah. it's a different or the brain is working differently, and it makes sense. But if they're genetically identical or very close, there is something more that might lead to this different that is coming through the development. Um, yeah. Cool, really cool studies. Very fun and exciting. Thank you. Lovely. I don't see any further questions. So in the interest of time, uh, we're going to briefly move on to our final paper, uh, which we probably only have time for a paper pitch. So you got five minutes, Victor. <laughs> Make the snap. Yeah, it should be all right. I mean, uh, I just, uh, yeah, review the, the paper very briefly. It's, it's, I, I don't have much expertise in that. So in that field so anyway i won't be able to do a a, a comprehensive review of it, of it but uh it's a paper that i've heard of uh, a lot in the uh the last weeks it was published uh i think last month uh in nature neuroscience and it's about uh mini brains or well brain organoids uh it's in particular, it's about the long-term maturation, as I said, I say the title of um, human cortical organoids and how they, um, their genetic markers uh, develop uh, throughout the, uh, their, um, their culture and to, to reach even a postnatal uh, state that are, well, that are something that is uh, similar to what you can you can see in uh, the um, genetic expressions uh, in postnatal brains. So it's uh, it's very exciting. Uh, just to to recap a little bit. So uh, brain organoids are um, like if you take some stem cells, you take cells, you 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 make um, pluripotent stem cells like. Uh, 
uh, in the uh, article of Laura, you make pluripotent stem cells with them, and then you put it put them in some uh, specific um, culture. Um, uh, how do you say? Uh, well, you, you put them in some specific chemicals so that they differentiate into a specific uh, type of cells. And then if you let them in this culture, they can form 3D, um, uh, 3D they, they will try to make a three-dimensional organ, a bit like them here, they will try to make a brain. They will not manage to do it, but they will end up in uh, some spherical uh, organ-like uh, clump of cell. Here, it's, uh, they, they differentiate the cells into uh, cortical, cell, cortical brain cells. And so we, you get, uh, how they call it, uh, a human uh, cortical spheroid, which is so the, uh, the, brain's, um, the, the, uh, the brain organoid that they are looking at right in this article. Um, and so, they, they say that um, right now we lack the access to these kind of uh, uh, of of tissue directly when for for study. So these kind of organoids are great, uh, but uh, we did not know if it was possible to have organoids that were anything else than. Um, fetus like or uh, brain or something like that so it really limited the range of question it could uh, try to answer with these organoids uh, and here in this study they um, they let the um, the organoid in their culture for up to i think uh, nine months or a bit more than nine months uh, to to check and, and they uh, systematically uh, check for the for different uh, genetic markers to see how the um, the cells were expressing their genes and what kind of gene were expressing what kind of epigenetic uh, marker were they could see in the, the cells um, and actually they man they, uh, they managed to show that um, there are a lot of paths that are um, evolving very similarly to what we can see in uh, a prenatal brain uh, with the same kind of direction uh, in the gene expression and this goes on to even postnatal brain uh, state so you have very uh, it's a it's a very exciting piece of uh, research because it really shows that um, you can have something that is, if not exactly the same, at least similar to postnatal brains. And this expands the, um, the framework of uh, what you can do with, um, with this kind of organoids and what kind of um, research you can do with, uh, with regard to the, um, uh, the disease that you want to study, for example, it, usually it was really about the um, uh, the neurodevelopmental prenatal state of the diseases uh, that were studied in these kind of organoids, and now you can uh, you can see that with this kind of um, research, you can pinpoint exactly at which at what point you want to study uh, the developmental state of the disease, uh, for example, um, for schizophrenia or something like that. The, uh, there are some uh, genetic markers that are very specific and that need to be, um, to be met. And with this, you can pinpoint where exactly in the development you, you can do that. And you can with that also open the possibility to uh, to see if we can develop further uh, after birth uh, after the equivalent equivalent of birth so the postnatal brain if we can uh, continue to study the development the development of uh, the neural development of uh, of brains with some pathologies and to to try to to study them uh, further uh, of course there are limitations 
with uh, the fact that you for, for now it really takes a long time a long time to to get to this point like nine months to to get to uh to a personal brain so brain like structure which is it can be very long i mean for people working with monkeys of course it's not they would say yeah we work with uh, uh with real um, animals and it takes way longer it's way more painful to do this but for but this kind of technique is usually more accessible and if every time you need to do a very long culture it can be a bit of a bother uh, so they are trying also to uh, well it's for the future but they will try to get uh, a way to uh, to move back and forth the uh, the time the, uh, the 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 development uh, the, the time how do you say that um, the point in time where the ah no it's not that's what I want to say the uh, the developmental stage of uh, of the organize, they want to be able to go back and forth in time, well, in time, in the developmental stage, so that you can study exactly uh, a specific time uh, in the development uh, of a, a disease. Uh, this could also be used to uh, to model epigenetic aspects of aging, which is great because it's also uh, something that is hard to study uh, in vivo. Uh, and yeah, a lot of there, there are a lot of different applications and some caveats that remains, but I think it's a, a a good advance that we have here. So I think we run, we are running out of time. So yeah, I'll stop there. Lovely, thank you. We got time for one question or comment. If there's anything burning, no. In that case, uh, thank you all for coming. This is all we have time for. For everyone on Zoom, if you want to hang back and get your questions out of the way, you're more than welcome to, to do that for a few more minutes. For everyone else, especially uh, everyone over on YouTube, have an exciting week in science, and we see you again on Monday morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.